Good evening, everyone. Kaya? Jupin Nunuk Jinanini Nala Katajini Nunga Motbadaya Kayan Kadak Nija Buja. Which means, as I'm sure you all know, um, that I respectfully acknowledge the custodians of the land, the Nungar elders and people. And with that, we'll start off the first of our events in terms of the new ECU lecture series sponsored by the West Australian. It's my pleasure to welcome you all here this evening. And our event tonight is going to be fantastic because it features Professor Lilia Green, ECU Professor of Communications, and she's going to speak on a very interesting topic, I'm sure you'll, you'll agree, kids, video games, and social networks, the internet in family life. And what, what can you think of anything else that's more integrated now into family life than, than the internet? So e ECU is very proud to partner with the West Australian in what's going to be an exciting series. And we welcome Lee Fletcher. Lee's in the front row. Lee, he's um, the marketing manager from the West Australian. Thanks for coming to our event tonight, Lee. We appreciate it. Now, each month, the West Australian ECU lecture series will provide a forum for an ECU professor to discuss a pressing issue facing our community, to outline their research in the areas that they work in and to engage in discussions with colleagues and the public. Because if you do research, it doesn't exist unless you communicate it, either by publishing or by presenting lectures or attending conferences, because it is the job of a professor to what, Margaret? To profess. And that's what we're going to have tonight, because uh, Lilia is going to profess to us about her research. So before she speaks, I thought I might just give you a brief introduction to Lilia's background. So her original degree was from Cambridge University, a small um, country university in the Fens of England. And when she was there, she studied archaeology, anthropology, philosophy, and psychology. Absolutely fantastic. And after graduating in 1979, she spent some time as an assistant producer with BBC TV. And this I'm very impressed with, because, because her, her, she mainly worked on that famous and riveting series, Songs of Praise, which some of you will know. In 1986, she accepted a job with what would become Edith Cowan University, and she emigrated to Australia to teach television production, media studies, cultural studies, and communication. Lilia's PhD research was conducted at Murdoch University, and it centered upon the 1987 introduction of commercial television to remote Western Australia. Very interesting. Now, Lilia is Professor of Communications at Edith Cowan University, and she's a, a Chief Investigator with the Australian Research Council Centre of Excellence for Creative Industries and Innovation. We started way back in 2005. And in addition, she's the Chief Investigator on 10 nationally competitive ARC grants, three of which centrally focus on the internet and on family life. Now recently, uh, Lilia and also with Dr. Donald Holloway were awarded a $365,000 ARC Discovery Project grant to examine family practices and attitudes around very young children's internet use in Australia and in the UK. And I'm very pleased to say and it was very enjoyable that last week Lilia also won ECU Staff Award for Excellence in Research. Well deserved. Not just because she produces a large number of, of high quality publications, which is very valuable to the institution, but also because of her mentoring, her leadership, her reputation, interdisciplinary collaboration, and that just doesn't happen nationally, it also happens internationally. So, without further ado, Please join me in welcome, welcoming Dr. Lilia Green to the le lectern. Lilia. So as you know, you're here because I'm going to be talking a little bit about the research that we've done for some years into kids, video games, and the internet in family life. And I'm going to start by telling you one of those poignant stories 
that occasionally get swapped at school uh, gates and suddenly make parents feel fearful. So this is something that one of our interviewees told us. So there's a young, young teenage woman and she's on social networks. She's taken a photograph for her friends to see and because she had geolocation on her phone when she posted it, you can just go through and see where her house is. And the mother suddenly thinks, that terrifies me. And it's things like that that do terrify parents, but I'm here to tell you that there are lots of things to be pleased about as well. I'm, as Professor Chapman said, as Steve said, I'm a researcher, which means that regularly I get to write 110-page research proposals. Um, if, if I were to give you the list of research proposals I haven't got, I could be here for an awfully long time, but we've been very fortunate at ECU in the sense that we have in the School of Communications and Arts won a number of these research proposals. So that means that we don't have to do, spend our time doing these things because we're funded to do really important research, such as the stuff I'm going to be talking about tonight. So thanks to First Dog on the Moon for giving me permission to show that. Um, and of course, it's not just me. We've done 978 interviews at least. We worked this out over the 10 or 12 years since we started doing this research. And so I'm part of a team of 17 communications and arts staff who have been working on these research projects since 2002. And some of them are past members, some of them are adjunct members, and some of them are still present. So it's very much a team project. But when you put all of the grants together that we've won since we started in 2002, it's $2,750,000. And I'm hoping to persuade you that that government support, which is paid for by your taxes, uh, has been well spent. And um, one of the things that I hope you'll be getting out of this is you'll be learning some of the research findings that we've come across. Now, not all the 17 people were working on the project that I'm talking about, or the projects I'm talking about now, the people that have been most carefully uh, c connected with this, uh, on the top, top, top row, and uh, are the key chief investigators on different projects. So myself, Danielle Brady, and Dr. Donnell Holloway, whom you heard about earlier. Underneath that, on your right there, is Kylie. She's been doing some interviews recently for us. This is Greta, who did the PowerPoints. I'm very grateful for her support. And I'll just take two seconds to, to mention Linda. Linda has been working with me since 1994, and next week she retires. So please can we just acknowledge someone who is a member of the professional staff. Because, of course, these are the unsung heroes. I, I wouldn't be standing here and I wouldn't be getting these grants in on time if it wasn't for people like uh, people who are working in the Office of Research who also do all the, the processing and the bills and everything else. And we are terribly grateful to them all. OK, so you've heard a little bit there about $2,750,000 worth of income. But how does that compare with our competitors, if you'd like to see us as a competitive market? And the answer is, very well. And I'm really telling you all this because I'm hoping that some of you will want to come and do PhDs with us and start your own research career. And if you're a younger person here, I know I saw some children come in, then start thinking about this. If you're interested in communications and media, come here and join the journey with us. So ECU has had 12 grants in the areas of media studies, communications, and cultural studies. And that compares with Curtin, that have had seven, um, with Murdoch, that have had six, and with UWA, who've had two, because UWA discovered communications only comparatively recently. And if that isn't good enough, because uh, I think that's quite good, but if that isn't good enough, since the government started this really special funding process where they take a new researcher with a wonderful track record and they fund them to do three years of research on a project, um, since they started that, they've only awarded 18 in, in our areas of research in communications and arts. But of those 18, two of those did their PhDs with the School of Communications and Arts. So we also have over 10% of those top-class 
new researchers doing their PhDs with us and going on to excellent research careers. So I just wanted to let you know that this is actually part of an ongoing project that involves lots of people, and we actually do it very, very well. Um, before I, I'll take you a little bit away from Perth now and take you to California and introduce you to a wonderful young woman called Jane McGonagall. Now, I know that some of you here will have people, often teenage boys, who want to be on Xbox Live or who are on Xbox Live. And a lot of parents have been told, you've got to be careful about this. You don't know who they're talking to. You know, that can be a bit of an unhappy environment. Let's hear what Jane has to say. So something that I'm a big fan of right now is the Xbox Live system. And I think it's a great space for exploring what youth today are learning about collaboration and um, collective intelligence and sort of getting a sneak preview of what work and school technologies might be like in the future. So if you sign up for Xbox Live, it's a, it's a network of gamers. And when you turn on your computer or you turn on your TV screen, you get real-time information about all of your friends, what they're playing, what the last mission they accomplished was, what they're trying to solve, how good they are at different games, how good they are at different missions and levels. And you can see who's online um, and, and what, they're, what they're up for doing. And so you have this sense of an ambient network of people that you can play with and collaborate with and, you know, at all hours of day and night. And you get to develop this kind of intuition about who's good at what, what they want to help you with, and what you can contribute that maybe nobody else has that knowledge or talent yet. Um, so you have a clear sense of yourself as a contributor and your network of potential allies. Um, and this, it's just an amazing technological platform that right now is only being used for entertainment, but clearly will have um, serious application in work environments and in school environments. So I think one of the smartest things you can do now is play in these entertainment spaces get used to being in these environments and, and start thinking about how we could apply them to real world objectives instead of just, you know, fun. Okay, so Jane McGonagall is putting her advice into practice. She's now a games developer at the Institute for the Future. And it's not often that you hear people saying, let your kids run on Xbox. And I will be dealing with some of the darker sides of the internet. So this isn't all um, a, a pro-internet thing. But let's, let's just say a little bit. As you've seen from your, um, from your chairs, uh, we've developed um, from the research 10 top tips that, that we would like to share with you. But just so that you know, the 10 top tips have been developed from those 980 face-to-face -face interviews that I was telling you about, including uh, how, about half of them with parents, half of them with children, and the parents don't know what the children say, and the children don't know what the parents say, and we talk to them about their lives online. But the first thing I want to say is, trust in your own judgment about your child and, uh, and how much they can do on the internet. And I say that because, as we'll find out, a lot of parents feel very guilty that they don't do more, and they feel that they don't know enough. But actually, when you start talking to children about these things, um, you'll see that children actually are very happy with what their parents are doing, and they're supportive of their parents. So if you look at the third line down, oh, wrong, sorry. If you look at this line here, this is, this is the children that say that they, Australian children, who would like their, um, their parents to do the same sort of uh, pay the sort of same sort of interest as they currently do. Three quarters of Australian children say that. Now, interestingly, the group that don't say that or say that slightly less, but still it's almost two thirds, are boys of nine to 12. And one of the reasons for that, we think, is because parents actually concentrate on girls in under 13, and then they worry about the boys once they turn 13. But actually, the, the, the nine to 13 year old boys also like those rules being in place as well. So it's not just us. The Australian Communication and Media Authority, in the days when they were still allowed to be funded to do research, uh, in interviewed 1,000 1, households, and they found out that most parents, most of the time, trusted their children. And so in general terms, and they talked to the children too, 
in general terms, parents and children are already well engaged in a really positive discussion on these topics. So the next thing is that most parents do have rules for their children. If you ask parents, do you have any rules, they start saying things like, well, you know, there's rules around bedtime, and then they start saying, oh, well, they're not allowed to put their telephone number on the internet. And they discover that actually there's been a sort of internalization of a whole range of rules um, that makes good sense to them and their child. Um, but as your child gets older, it's possible to include them in the discussions about what the rules might usefully be. And what we find is that children delight in scaring their parents. You know, if you say to a child what, what bad things can happen on the internet, the first thing they want to do is show you a photo of one of their friends that is doing something that they shouldn't be doing. And not only do you see that, but you see that they're, you know, that they've made a photograph and tried to make, make social capital out of it. So, so you say, well, how, how do you think her parents or his parents should have handled that? What do you think the rules should have been? Um, when we look here, uh, this is the slide I was telling you about a little bit earlier, um, we see the kids that would like their parents to do more interest, to actually say more, more rules. And you see how the, the 9 to 10-year-olds, 30% would like the parents to do more. By the time you get to 15 and 16, it's down to 13%. The 15 to 16-year-olds generally want to have a little bit more autonomy. But if you look at this line down here, these are the parents that think they ought to be doing more. These are the parents who are being made to feel guilty, either because they've got a parent in, the, in, the, in their circle that keeps giving them all the warnings, or because they've been reading all the terrifying st stories in the newspaper. Now, this is a difficult... This is a difficult rule, but who here has children under nine? Fabulous. You are so lucky because <laughs> for several reasons. The first is that you can decide now how you want your family life to be as, as your children grow older. So by the time mobile media had actually sort of taken off at the level of the family, a lot of families were stuck in the sense that they had those big computers and those big computers were in their kids' rooms and, you know, you couldn't just take the computer out at bedtime. I came across a family in the UK because um, we do collaborative research with London School of Economics and um, that, that family uh, had a 17-year-old and a 19-year-old. Um, so the 19-year-old was one of the adults. But the whole family had always been practised in leaving their media in the lounge. So one of the things we come across is that, you know, parents suddenly realized that their 16-year-old uh, went on social, you know, they, they woke up in the middle of the night, they turned on their social network, they saw something that upset them, and they haven't been back to sleep since 2 o'clock in the morning. They've been endlessly messaging, and there's a whole little group of three other 16-year-olds or four others, and there's a list of 100 or 200 posts. The best way for that not to happen to you and your 16-year-old is when they're nine, you start leaving your phone in the lounge room and your laptop, and you have a rule that says no electronic media in the bedrooms when you go to sleep. Sometimes that means that you allow the kid a little more leeway to stay up late because they're not allowed to do it in their room. But it also means that once they've gone to sleep, the chances are they stay asleep or if they do wake up, they don't then go down. Um, it also means that, you know, if you think it's fair go to look at their mobile phones, then they might also reciprocate. So, you know, those, those rules that you have in your family around sharing um, then suddenly come home to roost. But the essential thing is that the times when we've seen big conflict in the families that we interview is where parents do one thing and try and persuade their children to do something totally different. Um, okay, so the next thing that I'm talking about is the, the issues that arise when you look at actual filters. Now, a lot of filters are useful for younger children, and we'll see why that might be later. But in terms of the, um, in terms of the things that keep kids safe, what we'd like to suggest is that it's teaching positive behaviours early on. So, for example, um, filters make parents feel safe, 
But children have strong networks, and networks can tell them how you get around this filter. And within a day or two of a new filter being launched, there's a video on YouTube that tells you not only how to get around the filter, but how to get around the filter in a way that makes it look as if the filter is still in place. So the parent can feel reassured, but the kid is doing what you want to, is doing what they want to, uh, sometimes with the help of the... Um, and one of the reasons why it's the behavior side of things that are important is that kids then get into um, other people, other spaces. They go to friends' houses where the filters aren't in place. And if they are suddenly let off the leash, their normal sort of teenage risk-taking and, uh, and their willingness to find their own boundaries rather than to have them imposed from, from an adult uh, means that they start looking at things that perhaps they wouldn't normally have chosen to look at just because they only have three hours. And so people you know, say, oh, well, you've not been allowed to see these things. Have a look at this. So what we need to remember is that kids do take risks. And what is possible is that those risks can be supported risk-taking so that they needn't turn into harm. We'll, we'll be talking about, a little bit about that later. Now, one of the risks that parents are most fearful about are risks around pornography and sexual content. And unsurprisingly, given that much of this research has been funded by governments and they, they seek information for evidence-based policy, um, we made a point of doing research around sexual content. So we tried to do this in an open way. So we say to children in neutral ways, and this is from age 9 to 16, um, you'll have seen lots of pictures over the last year. But one of the things we tried to do here was we acknowledge the fact that parents are worried about the internet, but in fact, children are likely to see sexual content in all sorts of different environments, film, television, magazines, and games. So we, we started by saying, have you seen sexual content? And then we went on to say, and have you seen sexual content on the internet? When we look at the kids that have seen sexual content, um, and don't forget that if you're talking about um, uh, percentages, which is what these are, um, for nine to 10 year olds, for example, 90, well, 89% haven't seen sexual content in the last year. But we're talking here about the 11% that do, that have. At 9 and 10, 10%, i.e. 90% of the kids that have seen sexual content say that they were bothered in some way. So that 10% is 10% of the whole cohort. So it's 90% of the kids that have seen sexual content. By the time you get to 15 and 16-year-olds, over half of the kids have seen sexual content, but less than a quarter say they were bothered by it. So that would, that would follow what most parents would, would su suggest would be, as it were, a normal developmental pattern, that we do expect 16-year-olds to be more intrigued and interested in sexual content than 9 and 10-year-olds. And it's quite probable that 9 and 10-year-olds were shown things by other kids and that they hadn't actually gone looking and that they weren't particularly interested to start off with that. Um, but when we start looking at stuff that's unsuitable for adults as opposed to children, let me tell you a little bit about PewDiePie. Who here has heard of PewDiePie? Great. Well, well including the person who dogged him in as being an ideal. But PewDiePie has a signed-up following of 37 million people, mainly under 25. 37 million. That's the population of Canada. This man is a global leader. And he's a very silly global media, which is why most of us couldn't stand more than 10 minutes in his company. But as any 11-year-old who is a signed-up follower of PewDiePie would tell you, he has had 9 billion hits. And he's only been on his channel since 2010. 9 billion, that's more than one hit per person in the world. So this is the sort of thing that they get really excited about. And isn't it good that we don't have to get excited about it too? <laughs> okay, so you've seen a little bit there. 
as kids move into autonomy, and as you're hoping to grow up the next generation of adults, as they get to 15, 16, 17, and they're on the brink of being able to get you know, the driving license, uh, able to go to nightclubs and all the rest, you would expect to be negotiating more. And this is when we have issues sometimes with kids that have been exclusively brought up in a, in a house that's controlled by filters. So I think I've got a slide coming up later, but I'll tell you now, I'll, I'll give you a sneak preview. What we found was that there was no reduction in, in harm, in risk, for kids aged between 9 and 13 if they came from a house in, which had filters and blocks. So between 9 and, 13, 9 and 14, there was no reduction in risk. So they had the same risks as an open household where people talked more as kids got older. Um, for, 50, for 15 and 16 year olds, however, a, a kid coming from a house with filters and blocks was more likely to experience harm. And that's from the basis of 25,000 interviews in the 25 countries in the EU, as well as the 400 that we did in Australia. But it's not only kids that get up to bad behavior on the internet. If there's one thing that young people cannot stand, it's when their parents or their grandparents post on their social media, because it's extraordinarily hard to live down. And if you want to see patronizing behavior at its best, the thing to do is to irritate a young person with their social media. So let's have a look at this. Other times they are wholly unaware that their posts are public. What a cute picture of them all. Sarah, how is the job hunt going? XOXO mom, PS, call me. And then of course they will text you to make sure you saw their comment. I also love it when my family links me to things that I've absolutely definitely already seen. And by love it, I mean don't love it. Sarah, just found a great website for you. It's called Pottermore. Just type in http colon dash dash www.pottermore.com. Very fun. XOXO, mom. I'd like to apologize profusely in advance to my mom, who I know is gonna be so pissed when she sees this. I'm sorry, mom, I love you very much. You're adorable, you're adorable. I swear, you're adorable on Facebook. <laughs> okay, so if you want them to say, you're adorable, try, try messing up their social media. <laughs> um, so, we'll be talking a little bit more about sexual content in a minute, but our research shows Absolutely, that the thing that upsets most kids in terms of the internet, or most of the kids that get upset in terms of the internet, and we're still talking about really only three in 10 um, in any year, but the thing that's most likely to upset those kids is bullying. And um, one of the reasons for that is that, and one of the reasons why the cyber side of bullying is getting worse almost, is because we now have the capacity or they now have the capacity to have something horrible said to them where a whole class or a whole year group can gang up and like the horrible thing that's been said. So you suddenly feel that you're not only being picked on by three people, but you're being picked on by 30 people or by 100 people. When we said to kids, before we um, asked them about things like sexual content, so the first thing we said is, what sort of things on the internet might bother people about your age? And so from 9 to 16, they gave us all these different answers. But you'll see that the bullying is one of the large ones. Some of the other things, like violence, is something that really doesn't get talked about enough. One of the times when, when we were doing the interviews, it was soon after the um, Australian cattle were, had been slaughtered. Those films had been leaked about the cattle being slaughtered in Indonesia. Um, and some, some of the kids had talked about that, you know, we forget how disturbing news content can be for children sometimes. But bullying is one of the big issues. And one example of online bullying is, is here. So 
these, there's, there's a game that young kids coming into their sense of self sometimes play. They post video pictures of themselves in new outfits. In fact, I gather from, from dress shop owners that there's a whole routine where on Saturday afternoons, kids just try on clothes and take photographs of each other and then post them to the internet without ever intending to buy them. But, but one of the things they do is they play this game, hot or not. So you post it on a website, and it's up to people to say whether you're hot or not. And most of your friends will say you look hot. However, on this occasion, they all ganged up against the boy in the group and said, not. And uh, when the mother challenged them on, the, on this, they said, oh, no, no, that's OK. He, he won't mind. But a 30-year-old man who was um, on one of their, their said, called it and said, this is bullying. And sometimes you only need one person to say, this is bullying, it's not OK. And the whole dynamic will stop and the bullying will go away. So kids that are bystanders can have a really good role by, by being taught to recognize bullying and calling it when it happens. This is an example that another parent told us about a child, um, about a girl, uh, their daughter. So she had been sent a, a picture by someone in her class, and that picture showed uh, wrists being cut, or a wrist being cut. And the picture said, this is what you make me feel I need to do, or words to that effect. And the mother was horrified, and she rang the school and said, look, if my daughter's doing bullying, I want to know about it. And if this is someone bullying my daughter, I want, you to, know, I want to know about it, and I want you to do something about it, no matter what. And she'd rung the school, and then she rang to speak to the teacher, and the teacher didn't get back to her. She then went in and spoke and tried to get the year coordinator involved, and the year coordinator didn't get back to her. Now, on the um, list of, of, of supports, you know, I've suggested a number of places that I know have, um, have helps for this, including the Youth Fam Friendly Doctor Scheme. Um, we do training for them around social media. But also, it's worth raising these issues. If the, if the year coordinator and the, and the school teacher don't get involved, take it up, because schools have a responsibility. And we know that, uh, for example, the teachers that we're training at Edith Cowan University are passionate about creating safe and exciting and supportive uh, environments in which children can learn. So we know that the teachers need the support of the school to be able to put these practices into place. And parents, when they call, call for help, um, will do well. So here's one where the parent did get the help they needed. So as often is the case, the mum heard it from another mum and said, look, there's something on Facebook you should look at. So we've changed all the names, by the way. So of course, we wouldn't actually talk about real people with their real names. These are real interviews, but the names are changed. So Deanna, so the mum called Deanna in. This is a mum that didn't have Deanna's password, but this was serious. So she asked Deanna for her password. She went on to Facebook, and although Deanna wasn't the subject or the, or the perpetrator of this bullying, there was some horrible stuff there. And actually, it was two girls from different kinds of minorities within the school culture who had, um, as it were, gone public with this, with this dreadful experience of bullying. And so what the mum did was she get a, got a screen capture. She, she saved the, that evidence, and that's one of the good things about cyberbullying. And she sent it to the school, and the school got involved. And as you would hope with something like that, the people that were doing the social aggression apologized, and everything was resolved because the school had the evidence, and they took action. And that's what we would hope for. Um, at the same time, children try very hard to solve their own problems before coming through to speak to adults. And it's really important that parents acknowledge that and try and find out what they've already tried and talk through a whole range of ways, offering them ways to support um, their decision making so that they feel as though they've got some power and decision-making opportunities within this. Because when we look at risk-taking that goes to harm, it's much less likely to upset or distress children over a long time 
if they know that they have been able to um, take some choices and take some action themselves. It makes them feel as though they're not trapped in the situation. So find out what they've tried to do and encourage them by, the, by affirming what they've done and also making some other suggestions. And the sorts of suggestions that children and parents tell us they find useful is many of these websites have tools that you can block someone else or you can unfriend them so you don't see what they're posting. Um, and uh, the, the, the role of the bystander, as I mentioned earlier, can be incredibly important in calling bullying and moving it on. Um, so a problem solving at this stage can be a filter, can be a, a, a tool within the game, um, and it is good to go through these things before you start going into um, you know, doctors or, or schools or counsellors or what have you. Now, whoa. Um, and one of the interesting things about when we compared the Australian findings with the findings from the 25 other European countries that we were involved with, Australia is right at the second one down. So what that shows is that, you know that word cloud that had bullying in it? Uh, when we ask people, do you have any, you know, what sort of things would bother people your age on the internet? That word cloud was created from the 71% of our 400 interviewees who gave us a response. Now, the only country where a higher percentage of children gave a response was Denmark with 73%. And the next one was Norway in 67%. And it's really quite interesting. In a lot of ways, Australia is closer to those Scandinavian countries than it is to Britain or Ireland. Um, so when you start thinking about the sorts of risks, so, so sorry, to finish that point, um, if you talk to kids, our, our kids in Australia have opinions, they have suggestions, they have strategies. Often parents are so scared about things that they, they only go straight in with, with you know, something that another parent is doing or something that, that, that they saw on a television program. Whereas actually if you talk around the issue with a, a child, particularly as they move up through the teenage years, that can be incredibly affirming and a really good opportunity for parent and child to connect over these rules. And if you find it difficult to talk to a child about this, some of the, 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 one of the tips that parents have passed on to us uh, as, as something that they found useful is to go for a drive, to make sure, turn the radio off and go for a drive. Because if you're sitting next to the person you're trying to talk to about something that's difficult or emotionally charged, they're far more likely to be able to tell you about what's going on in their life than if you sit opposite them and sort of are interrogating them. So actually, a lot of sharing goes on side by side in a way that sitting opposite someone wouldn't necessarily. When we start looking at the sort of risks that people run online, I'd like you to think back to your own teenage years and think of the risks that you ran. The motorcycle ride at midnight that you never told your parents about, you know, this pool party where people had been drinking spirits and, you know, you were actually not allowed to drink spirits and you didn't know how drunk you were. You know, was there someone nearby to, to, to stop you going under and not coming up again? You know, when you think about the risks that other kids, ride, uh, other kids run elsewhere and put that in the context, put the risks that your kids are running on the internet upstairs in their bedroom in the context of fast cars drugs, you know, swimming pools, um, you know, nightclubs. I don't need to go through them. But actually, the amount of uh, concern that parents feel about the internet use um, might be only in terms of other ways to use the internet. But when you think about the other things they could be doing, um, actually, you know, some people could feel that they were very lucky. Now, I should have just used a bicycle, an image of a bicycle here. But I'm using this example to say that you know, going on a bicycle can be a risky business. And in a very small number of cases, it can lead to harm. But it also has lots of benefits. You know, you see the world in a way that you don't in the cocoon of a car. You're getting exercise. You're enjoying, you know, being out in the fresh air. Um, so that's to try and show the difference between risk and harm. And the way that we handle risks and support our kids to handle risks 
uh, can mean that they actually very rarely experience harm, even though they do things that we actually would prefer them not to do. Let me explain this very complex graph. I've put colors in to try and make it easier. Australia is the green line here. And this is the stuff I was talking about earlier. Those of you with really good eyesight can see that there's a 44 there. And that says that 44% of Australian children said they had seen sexual images in the previous 12 months. Next to that is 28%. That's how many said they had seen sexual images uh, on the internet. And just as a matter of interest, up above them, you remember that we were talking about the Scandinavians, up above them, Norway, 46% had seen sexual images somewhere, and 34% had seen it on the, internet, on the internet. And as a total change, let's go to Turkey, the purple one. So Turkey, 17% had seen sexual images. That's a very different cultural context. Um, and 13% had seen it on the internet. So that's a whole set of, set of um, data about 26 different countries, the 25 from the EU Kids Online plus Australia. On the next side, on this slide here, what we're looking at is children who've been bothered by seeing sexual images online. So Australia is about the same place. It's four down here, it's five down here. So you'll remember that we had 28 there. This doesn't add up to 100, by the way. I'll explain this to you. This, so 28% have seen um, sexual images on the internet. 10% have bothered by that. So 10% is slightly more than a third of the 28 who'd seen it. So 36% had been bothered by that. Does that make sense to everyone? So not everyone's seen the internet, se se sexual images on the internet, but of the ones that had, you had a, a one in three chance of being bothered in Australia. Oh, okay. Let's look at Norway now. So Norway, far more likely to see sexual images. Look where they are here. Far less likely to be bothered. What does that tell us? Any ideas? It probably tells us that sex is much less of a taboo subject in Norway. So kids don't feel as guilty about it. They're less likely. It's something that's far more normalized. People talk about sex in Norway, perhaps. Um, so the kids that see sexual images in Norway, 34% have seen sexual images, but only 9% of the total cohort, i.e. less than one in four, were bothered by it. Let's look at the other example. Let's look at Turkey. So there's Turkey, quite, quite a button-down culture uh, at the moment, a cultural context. They're right up at the top. Very unlikely to see sexual images compared to, say, Australian kids, but a one in two chance of being upset if they do. And this is really interesting stuff because what we're learning here is that the way we respond to this material is as much likely to be of a risk or to create some element of the distress that children feel as the content itself. I'm not saying that, there's, that there aren't horrible things on the internet, and I don't go looking for them, so I'm, I'm not able to tell you how horrible they are. I know they're there. But what I do know as well is that if kids are able to talk to their parents about things that have unsettled them, and parents can talk to their kids about ways to put that in the context of the people they meet every day, and and you know what, what a normal Australian relationship looks like, then those kids are going to be much less worried by what they're seeing. OK, so here's a description from a parent of a child when he was eight or nine. And so you feel for this parent and you feel for this kid. The parents pick the kid up from, from playing at a friend's house, and he jumps into the car, and he bursts into tears, and he's been so upset he can't even talk about what he's seen. Now, I'm going to break a rule here. Normally, if a parent, um, if we've interviewed a parent and we've interviewed a child, we never put them together so that we keep each confidential from the other. So we use them in different papers. But in fact, the thing that had scared this kid was it was a friend who had shown him something, but it wasn't a sexual image. It was a movie where 
it was been a nice little story when suddenly this creature, a screaming sort of skull head, jumped out of the, 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 the sort of everyday story that was going on, on the, in the internet um, you know, narrative and scared this child. And this child just didn't know what to do with that experience. And so almost 10 years later, she still doesn't, mum still doesn't know what it was. But in fact, it's things like that that often it is helpful for a child to talk about that. So what about the other thing? I know that almost every parent with a 16, 17-year-old is busy saying they spend so long on the internet. If there's one thing that really worries me, it's how much time they spend. They could be doing, they could be, you know, doing proper things, reading books, washing up, all sorts of stuff. Um, it, it is always the case that young people's behaviours become more and more uh, of concern to the kid, to the parents as parents see high stakes, um, you know, resulting from, from you know not doing enough homework or whatever. But it's one of the awful things about the research that we do that we get funded to look at under 18-year-olds, but no one's really interested in, as it were, a natural history of gaming. Because once you get to be an adult, you become a marketing target. You know, you're, 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 you're researched as a consumer. No one's interested in what happens to internet use when you become old enough to do other things, like have a car or, or at least drive a car, go to nightclubs, um, you know, go on holidays, all the things that people aren't able to do typically when they're 15, 16, 17, and the internet becomes their substitute sense of freedom and autonomy. So it's quite quite understandable that at 16 or 17, kids are spending a lot of time on the internet because it's the place they feel freest, and particularly if they're working on something like, like exams. And if a child suddenly changes their behavior and they spend a lot of time on the internet, what we have found out from the research is don't assume that the one goes from the other. So don't assume that it's because they're spending too much time on the internet that their behaviors change because sometimes it's the other way around. Something has happened in their lives, often, because, uh, often through interpersonal uh, relationships, so the bullying or something else like that, and they are seeking solace in the internet. They're seeking a refuge and they're looking for friends and support in their internet use. And that's why they're spending so much time on it because they're trying to feel safe. So if your child's in that situation, it's going to be really doubly difficult if you suddenly say you're spending too much time on the internet, we're taking the modem out, we're giving it to Uncle Bill, you know, you can, we, we've, we've, we've confiscated the laptop until after your exams. You know, this is particularly the time when um, good communication is imp important and perhaps um, talking to, to um, other people about that might also have noticed a behavioral change. Having said that, Australian kids are the worst out of all 26 countries in terms of... So they're right at the bottom because 50% of Australian children said they did one of the five activities down here. Now, I can regularly tick all of those boxes too. I can't tell you the times that I've, number three, caught myself surfing when I'm really not interested. Um, and the question is, what, what is this other 50% doing when they haven't ever done that? You know, how honest are they? Anyway, um, the thing is that, that we do look at this and actually you, you start wondering, how come, how come Cyprus is such an outlier? You know, how come 5% of kids in Cyprus tick all of these boxes when the average across Europe uh, is 1%? But that's just a question. I'm not Cypriot. I don't need to worry about that. Okay, so... When I'm talking about the natural history of internet use, let me introduce you to two apparently typical, healthy, normal, mid-twenties something, and their rescue dog. I just thought I'd put that in. Um, okay, so they look normal, but by goodness, they're not. Okay, this is what it looks like. Sort of 10 years on, um, since they've been old enough to have spaces of their own, they've had gaming suites set up. You know, so the, the, this, this is a young couple, they come home from work, they sit down. Uh, it, my parents' generation would have had a cup of tea. My generation, you might have a very small glass of wine with lots of sparkling water and, you know, uh, just sit down by the, by the table. 
These lot, they come in and they spend an hour on the, on the gaming just to relax, just to feel that all's well with the world and then they get on with their evening. Okay, so in terms of the final research finding, I would challenge most parents to think of things. Now, there's often some part of the child's life. You know, they might be good at sports. They might be good at, they might be beautiful artists. They might be talented musicians. But the chances are that they're also passionate about the thing that they choose to do on the internet. And it's a really exciting thing. I mean, as, as researchers, we are so lucky because we get to do what we're passionate about. And we talk to our interviewees, those 978 interviews plus, about things that they're passionate about. But it's actually quite exciting to have someone in the household who is as passionate as the average teen is about what they like to do on, on the internet. So my next one is, my next video is from Professor James G, who's saying, you know, what would it be like if we had education that kids could be as passionate about as they are about games? Let's talk about assessment, because assessment and testing is what drives our current school system. If you're not happy with how schools teach today, they teach that way because of the tests we have. So we've come to realize we're not going to change the paradigm of schooling and get deeper learning in it, learning for problem solving and innovation, unless we change the tests and change the assessment, because they drive the system. Now, here's a little thought experiment about assessment for anybody who's a gamer. Uh, we take it as completely natural that uh, you would be in an algebra class for 12 weeks and then I would give you a test on algebra, maybe one designed in some other state to see whether you learned any algebra. We take that as natural, we do it every day. So let's say a kid plays Halo on hard and you know he plays 30, 40 hours and he, and he finishes Halo, would you be tempted to give him a Halo test? No, not at all. You'd say the game already tested him. So let's think, why is it that we're not tempted to give him a halo test, but we are tempted to give that algebra test and use that as the judgment? Well, it's because you actually trust the design and learning of halo better than you trust the design and learning of that algebra class. And I think that's where we're going. We're going to be able to create learning that is so immersive, so deep, so rich in information about the development of people in that learning space that uh, the idea that we let some tests made in a different state trump what happens uh, outside of that learning will become primitive. We will see it as a very primitive thing. Okay, so this is the resources sheet. I'll just explain that there is a list of resources. Everything, sometimes you will be more upset about what's going on with your child than your child is. And it can be very helpful then to have something like the parent helpline to chat to. And I, I never make recommendations that I don't know from either personal experience or from uh, an interviewee that they've been useful and, they, and that they thought that it worked. Um, for younger children, the CyberSmart website put up by the Australian Communication and Media Authority is absolutely excellent. And yes, we would recommend that, 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 that families with, with kids uh, up to about 12 do think about um, the possibility of using filters because up to that stage, they can be helpful. Um, if you're interested in doing further reading, A, sign up and come and do our degrees. B, sign up and do a PhD. But I've left a whole set of um, reports on the back of that list of resources. The three with a little blue asterisk are what I call balanced reports, reports that look at the positives as well as the opportunities. And the discourse or the way that we talk about internet use um, in the research community and in policy is now moving away from talking about risk and is starting to talk about um, digital citizenship and children's communication rights, their rights to be heard, their rights to express their own opinion, their rights to be involved. So, um, so those opportunities and skills are really important. Um, so let me thank my sponsors. And that, in case you didn't recognize it, is Mario Brothers from a few years back. Thank you very much.